Uh, Christina Ward is the author of uh, Holy Food, How Cults, Communes, and Religious Movements Influenced What We Eat. Our phones are almost packed already for you, Christina. So uh, I'll keep another question I have short. But you were just about to tell us about kettle chips? Kettle chips, which are good potato chips. And as you mentioned before the break, is do we really need new foods? No. But potato chips, kettle chips, that is owned, it was in, started by Yogi Bajan. Yogi Bajan was kind of the inventor of Kundalini Yoga in the mid 60s oh, yeah. in Los Angeles. And, but what he really loved was capitalism. And he started cookbooks, restaurants, and food brands. Um, kettle chips, Yogi Tea, that is owned by the 3HO, Happy Holy Healthy Organization. They are a high control group. Uh, Yogi Bajan died in 2004, and his widow and the nonprofit church organization are still in the courts trying to unwind all of those myriad of business relationships as to the ownership. Because when Kettle Potato Chips Company was sold, they sold it for $320 million. So they may seem quaint, and some of these groups may seem quaint, but some of them are billion-dollar businesses. Yeah. I associate, Just to go back to the holy food and sex thing, I associate uh, that uh, particular brand of, of, of yoga-ism, I guess, um, particular brand of yoga with the uh, sexual... Um, practices, right? Yes. That was one of um, Yogi Bijan's things. His belief system was a little bit sick, a little bit Jain, and holy capitalism. And yeah. he, of course, like so many of these guru slash cult leaders, was found uh, later after an investigation to be sexually abusing his followers. That's what I thought. Yeah. And then having potato chips afterwards. Yeah, but but the potato chips are still kind of good, which is why I included recipes in the book, because that's to the nuance. Right. It, it gives you a better idea of what these groups were eating, and even some of the most highest control, terriblest groups can make a delicious meal. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the reading through the recipes. Uh, I, I'll be cooking some of them coming up. So <laughs> your um, do you want to tell the story of uh, of Welch's unfermented wine oh grape juice right right so, grape juice came about um uh, because it was looking people were looking for a substitute for wine and many of these groups um you know ban alcohol any kind of um well, it was a it was a movement within Methodism, right? Not all Methodists did, but some Methodists were practicing this, you know, so extreme the, version the, where even even a thimble full of wine on Sundays was too much. Yeah, it was, and so there was a market available for a substitute, and so the Welch's Company um, out of Concord, Massachusetts. That's how that came about, um, and it was part of by the National Grape. Uh, cooperative association who put this idea together to don't for, don't ferment the grape juice into wine, but just leave it as is and add a little sugar, and and there we go. Kids are but they they had to create the process to do it though too, which I thought was interesting that they had to create the process to keep the wine from fermenting because otherwise, if you put grape juice on any shelf over time it will turn into wine in some form or another. It'll, and so they had to create the process in order to do that, which was a big relief for people because I think at that point that particular Methodist movement um, had communion with like water and wafers or water and bread. And it just, they felt like this just isn't the same. Wow. Well, you know more about the Methodists than I uh, do. Sure. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one more thing. I thought was interesting about that. What I remember at the time, because originally when it came out, it was called unfermented wine, and that was a big deal. It had never been done before. So, in some ways, that was its own. I mean, you, anytime you see an unfermented wine commercial or for you know a, 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 for beer that is like you know has no alcohol, you can you go back to Welch's. Um, and he did this, you know, and because pe- there, not everybody has access to grapes. And this is an ongoing debate, by the way, in, in Christian circles is you don't really need 
both elements. You need one of the two. But people like to have both of them. But is it, could you say, well, we're in, we're in, you know, we're in the South Pacific, so we're, we're not going to have bread. We're going to have poi or whatever, and we're going to have it with a juice, you know, from passion fruit. Is that good enough for communion? And there, there are people who say absolutely not. It's got to be bread and wine. I think what a, it's kind of a Western way of looking at it. But the, in particular, the the Methodist Church, really, I mean, I, it, which is ironic because I'm a non-drinker, right? Never had any alcohol until I became uh, ordained. And I had to slug down this port, which was awful. Uh, I just hated it. And there's one thing I do not miss about weekly church services. Uh, but, you know, I would have been much happier if they'd served water with the or grape juice, for that matter. But we didn't. All right. Uh, is, let's uh, get to the phones because so many people are standing by. And it's it, it's just going to be kind of fun. Um, we don't know exactly what uh, these some of these questions are. I mean, I, that is to say, I don't know where we're going to go, but at least we can start in your home state of Wisconsin. Uh, John uh, is on a wild card line on Coast to Coast AM. Go ahead, John. Hello, Ian. Hello, Christina. I have several comments that will segue to Christina's book. But on a side note, I'd like to thank both of you for the kind words you had about Milwaukee when you introduced the Christmas. Love Milwaukee. Great town. I was born, yeah, I was born and raised in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee has had some of the finest ethnic restaurants for generations. I'm yes. retired now, and I live on a farm in north central Wisconsin. Prior to that, I spent over 30 years in food service sales in the greater Milwaukee uh, market. Huh. I supplied uh, restaurants, business and industries, schools and camps. And, and I'm sorry to share that over those 30 years, I saw such a decline in the quality of the products manufacturers oh, were interesting. Uh, making available to us. And I, I know you two people understand that. We could spend a whole program on that. But, yeah. But what we, what, what we had to do, uh, Ian and Christina, is we had to really work hard just sourcing products for our you know, white tablecloth restaurants that wanted the products they always easily could obtain. And that was a struggle. My other huh. comment, um, um, while I was in those, Milwaukee for those 30 years, I was a member of a very large evangelical suburban Milwaukee church. Every October, we had a missions festival where we invited missionaries from all over the world. They came in and shared their culture and shared their food. And it was a wonderful education for the young people of our congregation. We also reached out to other um, uh, religious groups. We did a Seder. I think it's spelled S-E-D-A-R. Christina Seder, yeah. Uh, dinner for the um, Jewish people. So my point is, and leading to Christina's book, I'm worried that the younger people are, are just not grasping the relevancy of what we put in our bodies, the culture of everything Christina has shared with us, and how they can share it to the next generation. So we just don't have obese people that don't feel good and don't feel right. good. And, and Christina, <laughs> right. you were just a joy to listen to. I want to thank you, and Ian, thank you for all you do. Yeah, thank you. That's a really, that's what it's going to come down to because so many of these foods are just, you know, full of fat and salt and we're going to end up getting, you know, fatter faster, which we already are, but we're going to have more health complications from the salt, which we already do. And we won't even know why. And, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to add on to that. In Eat to Live, which was written by Elijah Muhammad, the leader in, of the um, Nation of Islam, if you, he had a very specific diet that he recommended his followers to have one meal a day, which sounds familiar to a lot of people trying to lose weight. And he was also admonished anyone, uh, especially in the black community, from eating too much salt. He felt that salt was mm. killing the black population in the United States and that the processed food was killing black people. And it was meant to keep them down um, And because it was aimed. Most of the processed foods, of course, are cheaper than fresh and right. natural foods grown. And so it became a way, um, a form of oppression from the viewpoint of uh, the Nation of Islam. And yet if you follow the Nation of Islam diet today – it's really close to what the ideal nutrition dietitian recommended diet would be. You'd be well, really was... healthy if you ate the, like the NOI. Right. And I, I was a associate producer on a, on a project called Hungry Heartland where we, we, we were studying the disappearance of grocery stores 
in the very communities where the food is made. So, you know, they have to drive 50, 60, 100 miles in these food deserts to get to where the food is. And where it is often, or the the most convenient, are going to be the processed foods at the grocery stores. And so that's another thing. We, we, we swap out. They could morally, ethically, they could put fresh food in these stores, but they don't want them because they're not, they're not shelf stable. So it's all about, you know, discounting a price at a, you know, dollar general or, or whatever, making their money off of it and just turning their heads, even though the f- foods are filled with sodium and chemicals and the very people who are producing the primary ingredients for these foods are the ones that are going to be paying the biggest price for it. Um, yeah, and, yeah, food is a critical um, juncture at this time. More people are becoming aware of how overprocessed what we're eating is, but until um, I think folks start to really make better conscious choices, not just about what they're personally eating, but what they're allowing in their communities. And, um, you know, there, there's going to be changes coming, I think, because um, our healthcare system isn't going to be able to deal with the number no. of obesity and metabolic re- diseases caused by just this poor, poor American diet. Yeah, I go along with that. And, uh, and yet I still jones for a good bratwurst. I mean, like a really good bratwurst. Um, right. But I, I can't have it. Neil, uh, Nell or Neil? I can't see my screen. My stigmatism is bugging me. Is it Neil? In Santa Monica. How's everybody doing? Thank you. Uh, hey, go, go ahead. So, yeah, I'm on an uh, organic vegan macrobiotic diet. Uh, I uh, wrote a book that's endorsed by a uh, certified nutritional specialist. Um, I'm not going to mention my book. I don't think, you know, no big deal. But what I wanted to say is that I have overwhelming evidence that Christ was a vegan, not even a vegetarian. If he was a vegetarian, he was an extremely strict vegetarian, according to the research I've done. And the research uh, actually is non-biased because it comes from an uh, ancient study scholar, Rin Berry, uh, is a historian, ancient study scholar. And quote, unquote, he says that Christ was a vegan animal rights activist. Now, Pontius Pilate is the one who executed Christ. Okay, there's an inscription written on the cross. It it reads, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Now, according to the uh, Bible, it says the Nazareans, they were Jews by nationality. Originally from Glenditis, I can't pronounce it, and Bashitis and Transjordan. They acknowledged Moses and believed that he had received laws, not this law. However, uh, they were Jews and kept all the Jewish observances, but they would not sacrifice or eat meat. They considered it unlawful to eat meat or make sacrifices. And that comes from Epiphanius Panaranian 118. According okay. to the historian, okay, Rin Berry, I mentioned that. No, 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 I think um, that's really good. You know, they're, and very interesting. Um, but remember, too, there's a lot of other people who would say that may be true, except when you, by the time you became a rabbi, and he was, that that, that, that could have changed things. There, this is an ongoing debate. I, I'm not suggesting that your position is wrong. In a way, we'll never know, but it does open. It is open for conjecture. I don't. I just don't think that we have anything definitive about it. Um, the, but I, uh, what I would add to it is that um, there part of all of these new religious movements, whether whichever one you're calling a new religious movement or cult, they get that way. The schisms all happen because they're taking, they're reading a verse of something, they're reading uh, and interpreting right. it their own way. So even in the accepted, like, King James version of the Bible, there are discrepant verses um, about whether Christ and his group at that time were a vegetarian group or whether they ate meat. And there's discrepancies within the book itself. And so this is where, you know, unless the time travelers really can go back and find out for us, we're just not going to know. Right. One of the first things I learned in seminary was that uh, that some people um, 
we call it proof texting, um, that some people uh, use the Bible like a drunk uses a lamppost, which is m- more for support and less about illumination. And I think that's it's always true for me. But it, that still doesn't mean he's wrong. I mean, it still doesn't mean that, that all of the people that uh, that Neil quoted is wrong. It's just can't know for sure, but it sure adds to the debate. Joe is on a wild card line uh, for Christina Ward, Holy Food. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, thank you, Ian. I'm still laughing about that uh, lamppost. Um, there's a few things. Um, uh, uh, white rice. Uh, in uh, Asia, they only had uh, whole, uh, whole rice or brown rice. When the English went in there, they changed it to white rice, and a lot of the sailors were getting sick because of lack of vitamin B. But today, we have white rice and shusi. But if you ask them for brown rice, they'll smile and say, that's the way it used to be. Okay, that's one thing. And okay. some of the uh, some of the ways people have to survive is that they would have to cook it in in combination with certain other foods, like uh, like the wasabi is a, an amenagod, a amenagod, and it would get rid of um, uh, parasites. And if you eat raw fish, you, uh, the the um, uh, you need you need uh, something like that. Right, um, right. No, I appreciate that. Um, and let me go to John in the time before we get him at the bottom of the hour in Silicon Valley on Coast to Coast for Christina. Go ahead, John. Hi. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, you know if, you, if you think about like how this works, um, grace is is something that really comes into you know how, how you approach fruits and so forth. And there have been some interesting studies showing that like you know if, if you have gratitude for something it increases how much you love it and so if you think about grace in the christian world building that into that system would have actually helped them enjoy their food better and would have actually helped the family unit and could have actually been a huge benefit and so i'm curious whether you think that was intentional and whether that mechanism exists in any other religions christina um, I was a little unclear. Just is he saying rice or race? Grace. No, no, no. G R A C E. Being gr- being grateful for the the food that we're eating. Yes, thank you for the clarification. Um, you know, this is the question is really rooted in um, belief in a spiritual belief. Um, and if you are a protect, practitioner of a certain belief system and spiritual practice, then that's, you're going to believe that. I think we need to be careful and make, don't make the mistake of thinking that our spiritual beliefs are, are applicable to everybody else. You know, your God can tell you what to eat, but he can't tell me what to eat. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, we look at grace. uh, I mean, I was raised to understand grace as as a two step process. It's a vertical process, which then we have we are obligated to share horizontally. Um, And so if we look at it vertical and then into the horizontal, if we let it bottle up at that nexus point, then we're committing a sin. We accept the grace for ourselves. We won't offer the grace for other people. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of the essential challenge, I think, and one of the greatest uh, roots of apostasy, you know, people doing horrible things um, that stand against church tradition because, you know, they've got theirs and they're not going to share it. So it's kind of terrible. All right. We're going to give you the numbers again. Loved these questions. Loved these comments. Keep them coming. For Christina Ward and Holy Food next on Coast to Coast AM, this is Ian Bonnet. So many interesting comments and opinions about Holy Food. Christina Ward is the author. She's from Milwaukee. So it only seems important that we start with Karen in Wisconsin again on Coast to Coast AM. Karen? Hi. Hey. I am just wondering why no one's mentioning anything about all the bioengineered ingredients in food today. Because maybe because we're against them. <laughs> well, right. I am too, but it's devastating to know how many people are not paying attention and just buying them. Well, that's true. That's I think that's a subtext of what we're talking about. Um, but do you want to throw a thought in? on that, Christina, with regard to holy food and bioengineering? 
Um, you know, it's it's not something that comes up in in the history, the early history of it. It is something that you see in modern kind of sex and schismatic groups, which is a focus on quote unquote wellness and purity again, and you know, 100% organic and natural food. So you're seeing a lot of that movement where people actually are becoming aware. But it hasn't hit the mainstream yet, and that takes time. Just as a new religious movement or a new food is kind of introduced to the culture, new ideas about food take a little time to kind of get breakthrough to the mainstream. Yeah, and research your food. Why not? We research everything else, you know. Why not? Uh, first time yeah, caller line, Barbara is in Florida on Coast to Coast AM. Barbara? Oh, good evening. Hi. Mr. Eon and Miss Christina, I love your show because it's touching my heart. Mm -hmm. Um, My parents had a mom-and-pop restaurant in Pennsylvania, but I'd like to say what nationalities we were. Our dad was born in 1901. She was French, Lenape Indian, Uh and Welsh. And my mother, her parents came from Ireland. The only reason I'm telling you that is our mom-and-pop restaurant um, it kept it, your your food is another language we were taught by our right. parents because it introduces you to somebody's culture. So yeah. we always had to have respect if we went to someone's home, even if it was a different nationality, to try their food and say thank you. But one of the main reasons I'm calling is uh, with the community. A couple of doors up from our restaurant, there was Row Homes. Uh, was the Black Baptist Church, and Reverend Lynn Cochran taught our father to uh, uh, cook chicken a certain way. Yeah. Um, plus, I was married to a Pennsylvania Dutch Amish German. And um, so with the food and it's keeping the community together, and when I say that, at Christmas time and always Thanksgiving, our parents opened the restaurant free to the community, but oh, that didn't have anywhere to go. And what started out as always turkey and ham, all of a sudden, the people in the community started bringing pierogies. Oh, I love that meatballs. Yeah, right. And all of pierogies. Have all this different variety, and that's why I love this show because I look at it a different way. It's bringing people together, and so I love what? it. And thank you for letting me. Uh, voice my no, no, it's but very it's interesting. And Barbara, you, you remind me of something too. I was going to say is that weddings and funerals hold families together. We get together for weddings and funerals. We share a common table. We tell stories about the departed. We tell stories about ourselves. We tell whatever our origin stories. Um, but food holds communities together. Um, you know, families can have also, you you know, we all know there can be a vegan dish for so-and-so and and there's pork chops for Uncle Bob or whatever. And somehow that's okay around that table. But communities have to have a kind of commonality uh, to it in order for them to survive. And food is one of those things. Absolutely. And I, I want to chime in because that restaurant example that Barbara was sharing is great because we have that tradition of trying other things. And I think one of, um, something that's a little bit more lost today is that idea of the school lunchroom. Right. With your kid, everybody brought their lunch in, and it was subject to judgment and right. also exchanging. And we learned a lot as kids about, as you mentioned earlier, Ian, going to someone else's house. So you go right. to a different restaurant, and I think um, you know Neil mentioned it and John mentioned it earlier about like ethnic restaurants. So this food is, brings us together, and um, it will continue to do so. And the fun part, I think, is learning where it all comes from. Yeah, you know, and nobody wanted to trade sandwiches with me because of, <laughs> because of the budding, you know, that's all that we could afford was this sort of lunch meat that you could see, you could read through it. You know, it was, it was like a spray painted paper and it tasted like that way, too. And so when we were flush, we could buy Oscar Mayer. <laughs> You know, we, we the family was poor family too. There was yeah. also that um, I remember the neighbor girls always had 
peanut butter and mayonnaise sandwiches. Yeah. Which disgusting to me, but they right. love them. But this is yeah. how we we become a community. Right. And my uh, my uh, uh, Yankee grandmother, who lived close up to the Canadian border, we were fascinated by mayonnaise and French fries. Just couldn't get over it. I was like, what are you doing? You're ruining a perfectly good French fry. And, you know, ketchup is actually a really interesting example, too, because it's a whole other area. Um, we take condiments, for example, uh, just in general. And originally ketchup was uh, fish-based. And it was, they, it was transported to England um, via ships because it was – this was something which people were it had flavor anyway it was fermented and it went on top of their bread or whatever else they were having and it provided flavor but in england there's lots more tomatoes than they wanted to give up the you know fish parts for so ketchup switched to being a ketchup a, a tomato based condiment that was fermented that people put on their on their sandwiches and stuff and i think that was awesome Interesting. Yeah, and if you look at like earlier recipes before tomatoes became pervasive in ketchup, you'll see other fruits and vegetables used oh, really? in combination. Yeah, because it's actually it, as a fish sauce, as a fish condiment with other bits and flavors in it. Ugh. It um, originated in, in that Indonesia area. Right. That's what um, I thought. The yeah. Islands, and that's how it came to first England, and again came to the U.S. George Washington had a favorite ketchup recipe that is in his common book. Oh, interesting. No, I, t I t completely didn't catch that. So what was his ketchup recipe? What was special about it? Well, I would actually challenge people, if you're a home cook, go look at old ketchup recipes because it tastes nothing like modern you know, sugary, right. tomato-based ketchup. Corn syrup-based. Yeah, and so yeah. The, that version of a recipe has garlic and it has spices and mustard, and I think his had peaches in it. Um, oh, and interesting. It also had. I'm going off the top of my head, remembering the recipe. Um, vinegar, you know, again, that the sure. acid for the preservation, and right. so it really just all jumbled together, fermented, and if you make it, it's delicious. Yeah. Oh, I so love that. Thank you so much. I would I actually would be interested in trying that. You know, it's it became then it sounds much more like a relish per se. Um it is. It's related to that relish chutney quote right. unquote pickle. And I don't mean like cucumber pickles, but no, no. pickles. Right. Um, very interesting. Okay. Well, again, we, time is running out for Christina Ward and Holy Food. Gary is in Pennsylvania on Coast to Coast AM for Christina. Go ahead, Gary. Thank you for thinking my colleague, and I have two comments and a question for your guest. My first comment Got to be quick. You know, you mentioned that you, you were gonna get the drummer from the Doors in the show. I think that's great. John Densmore coming me, up. I yeah. really think that in the realm of possibility someday you might be able to get Britney Spears in there in the near future. Oh, I mean, a heartbeat. Other, my, other, my other comment is you and your guests have me so hungry that when the show is over, <laughs> I'm running out and getting myself yeah. a Cherry Garcia ice cream. I haven't had one in two months, but you guys got me going. Very, very good. Okay. And my question for your guest or you, 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 either one of you would know this. I don't know the answer. But you were talking about the book of Genesis and the forbidden fruit and the apple. Well, the apple comes from the rose, from the rose uh, uh, species. And, and the, you know, the rose is a symbol of, of, of purity and beauty. Does that have, in, in, in you guys' mind, anything to do with the fact that, uh, the apple was a forbidden fruit, and I'll hang out with the imagination. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, that's fair enough. I always heard in seminary that it was actually whatever it was, it was closer to a pomegranate. Um, that you know, it, and not even I'm not even saying the story is true. I'm not making it a factual claim, but that that's what people would have understood. Um, and pomegranates have um, a significant religious significance in many, many cultures. Um, it's a symbol of, like, everlasting life, of fertility. Um, so a lot of foods and fruits especially um, have a lot of symbolism put onto them by people who use it as a representation for some element of their spiritual belief. Yeah. Um, it does share the same Latin root, which is how we I think we've made that confusion uh, over the years, uh, we'll go to uh, Linda in Spokane on Coast to Coast AM for Christina Ward. Go ahead, Linda. 
Hi, Ian. Thank you for taking my call. Um, all this talk about food, I think I'll just stick to my wine and cigarettes. Uh, <laughs> I can't argue with that. It's not good for you, but so what? Neither is a big yeah. box of kettle chips. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyways, I'm just one wondering. Uh, you mentioned your Uncle Bob bringing the pork chops. Well, um, I was in a bookstore and buying a book, and on the back shelf, there was a book that said, Jesus, bring the pork chop. <laughs> Anyways, I was going to say maybe he's in a battle with his father because the uh, God in the Old Testament was uh, saying, bring the fat, fatted calf okay. and the prodigal son comes home and he was requesting innocent animals sheep and innocent animals to be slaughtered for him and in the catholic church all you see is jesus hanging on a cross being tortured and uh maybe this is all a war between the son and the bad father of the Old Testament. Well, I don't know about that, but that's an inter- it's an interesting thing about the idea of the fatted calf, because then that also speaks to the idea that perhaps um, beef or, you know, goat meat or anything was actually kind of rare. Um, that, you know, you say that that was a special occasion kind of moment. Do you have a thought on that, Christina? Absolutely. Um, animal proteins were and still are the most expensive um, type of protein to try to to consume. Um, the money and the time effort to grow the animal, essentially. Um, and so it was only used for feasts and celebrations, only. It was not something that people ate like Americans do, where there's right. every meal. Going back even just 75 years, it was very common that people only had meat maybe two, three times a week. Right. And when she was talking about that, I, I'm reminded of the binding of Isaac, you know, the the source of in some ways. I mean, it kind of it was one of the branches off um, from that tradition into Islam. But there's the idea that that Isaac was being bound up like a sacrificial animal um, mm-hmm. and, and uh, that 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 had significance. It wasn't just like, an, it's not another day at the, at the Oscar Mayer plant, right? I had a friend who worked on the, uh, I'm, I'm sure we all have known somebody in some respect, but I had a friend who worked on the, uh, on the abattoir floor, you know, on the, and they, they literally on the killing floor. And that was, that was fascinating because he said they would rotate you out every two weeks. You weren't allowed to stay there for long because you get acculturated to the idea of killing animals. I don't think of psychologically it was good for people. So you got you spent your time down there, and then they rotated you to, to like, the casing division or something like that. Yeah, they, they didn't do that in the early 1900s in the meatpacking plants in Chicago, which gave rise to the— there's a metaphor in blues music, in black culture, called on the killing room floor, which means right. you're absolutely bottom of the barrel depressed because right. that has got to be the lowest of the low. Yeah. Uh, well, of all of the things you learned for holy food, what what's the one that you still think is just so like that? I mean, you, I mean, obviously you, you've got a you've got a lot of stuff in the book. So I mean, I I don't know if you could just if we've already talked about one, give me the second one that makes you just re- that you really th- had thought, why well, God, I cannot. More people need to know this. I think that um, one, the thing that my big takeaway, and I want more people to know, is the interconnectivity, especially in the 20th century, of all of these groups. And I'm not talking about a shared belief system, while they did share a lot of beliefs, but the, the actual, they knew each other. So Yogi Bhajan knew Jim Baker, who is Father Yod from the Source family. Father Divine from the Peace Mission 
um, was his biggest fan and who tried to take over the peace mission was Jim Jones of the People's Temple. All of these people knew each other, and uh, these groups tended to kind of feed off of each other, especially in the 20th century. That was a real surprise for me, and I think that's a big takeaway to realize, again, how interconnected not just the food culture is, but the actual relationships between people. Uh, I was reminded uh, while I was reading about uh, Bernard McFadden. Um, did you come across him in your in your research? Um, McFadden, I I'm trying to remember. There's a no, lot no, no. Of- I'm I'm throwing a throwing yeah, a curveball at you. Out, it's not coming uppermost to my mind. Okay, so that was a made up name. It was kind of his nom de plume, uh, but he was one of the early proponents of physical culture of the of posing and you know bodybuilding and posing and he used to put himself on the cover of his magazines that's that he's on the cover of I, I can't remember what it was called physical culture but um and he was really into nutritional information and he, there's a long running magazine um, yeah. And it was hugely successful. But what's interesting about him, just to speak to the larger issue, is that he also is the guy who is considered by many to be one of the founding fathers of the true crime movement. Yeah. yeah this um, big publication yeah. empire. And he was really into 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 crime stories. It was very yeah. lucrative. But yeah, I said that. But- McFadden, before McFadden, was the German nature mention movement, the outdoor movement. And that is where, when it came to the United States, um, and that's where that idea of um, where Rudolf Steiner, Waldorfism, biodynamic farming, um, being outside, Wandervogel, health food, all of that came from that late 1800s. Um, all of those German immigrants who came here uh, to the United States and really st- kick-started that health food vegetarian movement. And well, so, you're gonna, exactly. people have to read this book before they get together for their next family and or community meal. Holy food. Thank you, Christina Ward. I hope you had fun. I know it was a stretch. Um, you know, it's like middle of the night, even in Milwaukee, but thank you so much. I won't be back on again until early December. So it'll be after Thanksgiving. So again, I plug this and as an early gift too. John Densmore of the Doors will join us on one of those visits coming up. And in the meantime, Um, in every way healthy possible. Deus te amat, and I do too.